Hello, my name is Stefan Burns. I'm a senior geophysicist with Geometrics, and today we're going to be talking about passive seismic, shear wave velocity profiles, survey geometries, and the Fibonacci sequence, and how all of these relate together. Here's our presentation outline. We're going to be talking about passive seismic methods, how they differ from active seismic methods, shear wave velocity profiles, why they're important, where they're used, surface waves and how you can use surface waves to create shear wave velocity profiles, and the different array geometries that you would use to collect these surface waves. We're gonna then show some data comparisons between these different survey arrays, and then how the Fibonacci sequence can apply to all of this and how it can improve your data quality. Now, this whole presentation and the data collected here as a result of the Napa Valley Seismic Project, which is a research project I founded in the summer of 2020. I basically wanted to test out our atom seismograph equipment, which Geometrics manufactures. I wanted to learn more about the passive seismic method. And I also wanted to start to understand the Napa Valley geologic structure and the earthquake risk to Napa. Uh, being from Napa, this is something that's always been important to me. And the Napa Valley has a lot of seismicity to it. Uh, up north, there's the geysers, which is a very large developed geothermal field. And then in 2000, there was a magnitude 4.9 earthquake. And in 2014, there was a magnitude 6 earthquake, which uh, created a lot of damage. So this is something that's very important for the community and also to use as a microcosm for the greater world. Manapa being so actively seismic, this is such a great area to do research. So that's exactly what I did. And over the course of the Napa Valley Seismic Project, I did about 100 plus passive seismic surveys. And that's what led me to go down the rabbit hole of exploring survey geometry, how that can influence data quality and some interesting experiments I did from there. Here's a map showing SF Bay Area earthquakes from 1968 to 2008. And this is all magnitude 2.5 greater data from USGS. And you can see first off that the Bay Area has experienced earthquakes nearly everywhere along every fault. So it's incredibly active seismically. And for California, the risk to human lives and infrastructure from earthquakes is much higher than most other parts of the world with a few exceptions. So as a result, Bay Area geophysicists are at the forefront of earthquake research. And the primary way to assess the geologic risk of a, of a site is with the shear wave velocity profile. Now, when we're collecting this data from all these different engineering firms and government firms, it's important that uh, good data is collected. And currently, survey geometry is a underweighed aspect of collecting data. It's not given much consideration. So I wanted to show how array geometry can have a big impact on your data quality and what some best practices are. Here's a shear wave velocity profile. And right now the industry guidelines only require shear wave velocity information for the very near surface, the top 30 meters, uh, which is also the top 100 feet. And these ground motion prediction equations use this average shear wave velocity information for their calculations. And it happens to be about the expiration limit for active MESW, multi-channel analysis of surface wave methods. So everyone's happy. Everyone can use their active MESW methods and get their data for the top 30 meters, which is then used by the structural engineers and buildings can be built safely. The issue is that for understanding overall earthquake risk, you have to understand more than just the top 30 meters. And this is very important. There's deep geologic information and then there's shallow geologic information. And we have a bit of a gap between the two that hasn't been explored as well as either side. So a lot of these engineering firms and also the USGS have a lot of data for the top 30 meters. You can find databases of uh, shear wave velocity information for the top 30 meters on seismimager.com. And 
there's currently a lot of understanding there and it's pretty easy to get geologic data for the top 30 meters at a site before you build or when you retrofit a building. Now the USGS also has a lot of deep crustal information, uh, structural geometry, really, really deep moho, mantle, that sort of stuff. But the issue is that there's very little attention given to uh, geologic data from 50 meters to a kilometer. There's definitely a gap there uh, seismically that very few people explore as it relates to earthquake risk and geologic structure. And this is where passive seismic is great because passive seismic really easily collects data from zero to a kilometer plus in depth. Whereas active seismic, because it requires a source, an energy source, really struggles to collect data beyond 30, 50 meters. So this is passive seismic. It's almost as, it's almost as easy. Uh, you don't need any sort of vibrator truck or sledgehammer or propelled energy generator or shotgun. None of that's required. Now here are different waves. We have P waves, S waves, and surface waves. And when you collect passive seismic data, you're collecting all of these because you're basically collecting data continuously. You have a geophone, you have a seismograph, it's in the ground, it's just always collecting data. Now P waves as a refresher are compressional waves. So they compress in the direction of propagation of the waveform. And S waves, shear waves, they'll shear perpendicular to that direction of motion. And that's what makes them destructive. Surface waves are the most destructive though. Most energy is released during a surface wave and there's Rayleigh and there's love waves. Rayleigh waves shear vertically, love waves shear horizontally. Surface waves travel along the surface of a medium and are characterized as being low velocity, low frequency, but very high amplitude. Remember, amplitude is strength. Uh, so, and so a lot of seismic energy, about 70%, is released with surface waves and surface waves cause nearly all the destruction of an earthquake. And typically when surface waves are discussed, it's in reference to Rayleigh waves. Love waves shear horizontally, and there's still a lot to be learned there and how love waves impact earthquake risk and HVSR methods, Nakamura method. But uh, typically, as of right now, Rayleigh waves are the primary focus of study. Now, the reason why surface waves are important and why uh, the ultimate, why they're important when the ultimate goal is to collect a shear wave velocity profile is that surface waves are primarily sensitive to shear wave velocity uh, of the ground. So they're much easier to capture though. Surf shear waves are fairly difficult to capture. Surface waves are quite easy. Again, they, they manifest at the surface and most of the energy from a seismic train is in the surface waves. So if you're able to create a velocity profile, a shear wave velocity profile from surface waves, then you've simplified the method and you've, been, you, you've effectively been able to increase the scale that this technology can be distributed and reduce earthquake risk by building safer buildings. Here's a surface wave propagation velocity model to gain some understanding here. Here's the waveform when it first starts and here it starts to propagate out. You can see how close this surface wave is along the S wave. So that's why they can be used interchangeably. And that's also what makes shear waves so hard to diagnose in the data because they're right up against the very high amplitude surface waves. So it's easier typically to just focus your attention on the surface waves and then get your pool your shear wave velocity information from that. Uh, one thing with this model is you can see that the source is propagating, it was at the surface and propagating down. That's how active seismic methods work. You will have a sledgehammer and you'll hit the ground and the source, the energy will radiate down. But with an earthquake, it's the opposite. The energy radiates up. So that creates a completely different dynamic. And this is important because if you want to understand the geologic risk for a site and you want to have a really good shear wave velocity profile, then you should probably understand it and uh, observe it under the same conditions that would be similar to an earthquake and not through artificial conditions of creating energy at the surface that then goes down. 
And you can best do this with micro tremors. We're going to talk about micro tremors in just a little bit. Here is the surface wave dispersion. You can see you have this low frequency, high velocity band, and then this high frequency, low velocity side, and overall this very large body of surface waves. The P waves and S waves are actually right here, but they're gained down. You can barely see them because the surface waves are so strong that they just gain them completely down. Now, one thing that's important, um, which I meant to touch on earlier, is the basin ed edge effect, the basin edge effect. The reason why you want to know more than just the top 30 meters is that seismic energy can get trapped depending on the geologic structure. If you have a structural basin, uh, any, if there's an earthquake and energy then enters into that basin, it can get bounced around and amplify in the basin, dramatically increasing the energy release at the surface. If you were just to get a shear wave velocity profile for the top 30 meters and get your IBC uh, site code, your site classification, you'd be like, oh, great, okay, this is a site class B, we're fine. But there might be a base and edge effect underneath you that you would never know if you didn't survey deeper. So uh, that then could increase the risk, and there now is a disparity between what the actual, what the actual risk is actual earthquake risk and what the uh, the risk assumption was when building uh, that structure. So that could be uh, a big deal if an earthquake happens. Here are the scales of investigation. Active methods typically work really well from about zero to 30 meters, maybe a bit more if the source is really strong. And they can capture wavelengths one to 15 meters in length. The frequency range that active methods work really well at is about 5 to 50. They don't work well below 5 hertz because it's really difficult to create sub 5 hertz noise, but they are good at collecting data beyond 50 hertz. And you can use active methods for IBC classifications, foundation engineering, void detection. Some of these uh, specific uh, use cases are best with active methods. Now you also have passive seismic, and passive seismic works really well from really low frequencies like 0 0.1, 0 0.2 hertz, all the way up to 30 hertz. This graphic here is a little outdated. And you can collect data that's tens of meters to several kilometers in wavelength. So it's really, really powerful in being able to get data from zero to a thousand plus meters and fill in that gap where a lot of people don't have data. Uh, government organizations, and definitely not engineering organizations. So micro tremors are what make passive seismic possible. At all times, everywhere around you, uh, there's different waveforms traveling through the Earth. We know that there's electrical waveforms like magnetotelluric waves, there's electrical energy, but there's also seismic energy. And this seismic energy, these micro tremors, this ambient noise is created from a lot of different sources. You have uh, wavelength, uh, you have sea waves that crash on the shore. That'll create a, a very low frequency surface wave. You have wind, which also does uh, create surface waves. And then you have factories and industrial noise and cars and traffic. And these all create these higher frequency surface waves, these micro tremors that are just kind of always propagating through the earth. And these micro tremors are very low in amplitude, right? They, they might not be that strong and they're constantly attenuating out, but they're kind of cohesively everywhere all at once. And with certain geologic calculations, you can use these micro tremors to quantify the subsurface. With active seismic, the location of the source is known. You have a straight line, you have a sledgehammer that's in line with that, you hit it, you know the location of the source. So there's no confusion in the data processing. With passive seismic, it's different. These micro tremors vary in propagation direction and intensity, and the source is completely unknown. So you don't know these propagation angles prior to measurement. Are they going down, uh, horizontal, diagonal? They're coming from all directions. And since propagation angles are unknown, we have to use methods like the spatial autocorrelation method, SPAC. And this method assumes that micro tremors radiate from all different directions. And this method can be used 
independent of source location. Passive seismic field methods originally used two receivers, two geophones, but now with uh, increased computing technology and new software, multiple receivers can be used and all the pairs that form between these receivers can be analyzed. So each, each receiver will collect, will collect data and uh, it's, you compare the data from one receiver to another. And originally with just two pairs, you would just compare these, then you move them out like this, compare them again at a new wavelength that you're capturing. Uh, but now with these multi-channel arrays, I can compare this one to this one, I can compare this one to the center, this one to the side, uh, even with these microtremors propagating from all directions. Now this is important because uh, since the propagation direction of, of microtremors is unknown, survey geometries with increased dimensionality are way more robust in analyzing the coherencies from multiple directions between the geophones. And the next slide is going to cover coherencies. So survey arrays which are less dimensional, like a line, fare poorly compared to 2D arrays such as an L shape or a circle. Coherencies are the foundation of the SBAC method. For passive seismic ambient tomography um, methods, two or more geophones record data over a long period of time, right? You're collecting data for 10, 15, 30 minutes. You need sufficient micro tremors in order to elucidate the shear wave velocity of the subsurface. And since the data is accurately timestamped with GPS, the data from the geophones, the different receivers, can be directly compared in terms of their similarities and dissimilarities in wavelength, frequency, and velocity. So the fact that you can directly compare these at accurate time spans, uh, timestamps lets you generate these coherencies. How similar or dissimilar is the data from one receiver to the other? That's the coherency. And a coherency of one means the data is exactly similar. A coherency of zero means the data has zero similarity. And a coherency of negative one means the data is exactly opposite. So for SPAC methods, higher coherencies are better. And here we have some coherency plots at 33, 43, and 50 meters. And we can see that we get good coherency uh, centered around one hertz going from about 0.4 to four. And then it drops down after 10 hertz. It, kind of settles out around zero. Now this is a long wavelength, so a shorter wavelength would have better coherency at these higher frequencies, but for, uh, for a greater distance between them, the only coherencies they're really going to get are for wavelengths centered around that distance. So frequency and wavelength are intimately tied together. So here's an example. You have a direction. You have a wave uh, propagating this direction, and because it's going to pass through that receiver at a different part of its of its waveform, you're going to get a difference in coherency. But when it travels perpendicular uh, with that direction of propagation, your coherency is going to be exactly one uh, because it's going to hit them at the same time. If it's oblique, it's going to be some function of this original pattern. It'll be spread out, it'll be condensed, uh, however. So uh, we, we, we don't want negative coherencies. That's the big thing is we don't want any negative coherencies. Ideally, we want really good positive coherencies all through, through all the different frequency ranges. That'll give us the most confident data, the best data that we can then process um, all the way down to a shear wave velocity profile, a dispersion curve. And, and that, that's important because how, how you stack passive seismic data will influence your results. If you collect data for five minutes, good luck getting good coherencies. But if you collect data for 30 minutes for a 50 meter array, you'll get some pretty good coherencies, especially if you're in an area that is pretty quiet um, in terms of like car noise and such. So you stack passive seismic data by using cross correlation between the two different receivers, one and two, and you then can stack those over time. Uh, you, you, you basically break it down into time blocks, and overall you can get this nice waveform 
uh, even though your passive seismic, your passive um, uh, ambient noise, right? These micro tremors are propagating from all directions. There's no stacking. In, in active seismic, you have to stack your data. You have a signal to noise ratio. You want your signal high and your noise low. Your micro tremors are actually your noise. In active seismic, your micro tremors are your noise. And with passive seismic, your noise is the active data. So it's, it's definitely a flip-flop. And you improve your signal-to-noise ratio in passive just by letting it sit longer and for record longer. So here's a, a little bit more of a explainer in terms of coherency and how that can look with a multi-receiver array. For micro tremors propagating from all directions, receivers are best spread out over a 2D area. Some wave frequencies will be captured with bad coherency values, others with good coherency values. But when you average them using a Bessel function, you can get the average coherency across all the different receivers. And the frequencies with the highest coherencies for that wavelength will dominate the wave velocity. Remember, this is based on the SBAC method. And more receiver combos that a, uh, an array can have that exists perpendicular to the direction of propagation for a waveform, then the higher the coherency of the data. Again, you're always striving to get really good uh, perpendicular uh, pairings for this direction of propagation. And since you have directions of propagation coming from all areas, you really want receivers spread out in a way that creates a lot of perpendicular pairs. And uh, Therefore, what's important is that you want to get as many angles, unique angles created between 0 and 180 degrees. That will ensure that you're uh, recording these micro tremors in the best direction of their propagation. And uh, you'll get a really strong coherency for some of them. Some of the other receivers will record them uh, a little lower. But overall, they'll give you a higher coherency across the board and therefore better data. The passive seismic, your record time is important for how deep you want to go. If you're trying to get these very long period wavelengths, these one kilometer wavelengths, you're going to be recording for 60 minutes, 90 minutes, 120 minutes. But if you're collecting data in the top 100 meters, then you can record for 30, 40, 50 minutes. I typically would like to record for about 45. Um, no matter what I'm doing, I just find that I get really good data with 45 minutes. But this is a general function that you could follow. And I have collected great data to about 60 meters before in 10 minutes. So I was very surprised by how fast these passive seismic methods can work. But irrespective of the record time, passive seismic is very easy to deploy compared to active seismic. With active seismic, you have a spread cable, G phones, you put them out, you have to get your trigger and your sledgehammer ready. It takes a long time and it requires a two man crew. With passive seismic, you just take your receivers, you put them out, couple them to the ground, and then you just hang back for a little bit while they collect data. So the whole process is much, much faster, even if you're waiting 45 minutes for really good data. Here's kind of the process of uh, how you take this raw waveform data and turn it into a shear wave velocity model. So you have raw waveform, you create a dispersion curve, a um, phase velocity image out of that. And here's your dispersion curve right there. So when you, when you take those picks, then here, that's where they'll turn out to be. And you can then create a shear wave velocity model from the dispersion curve. And the way you can do that is after uh, surface wave data has been processed to the dispersion curve point, then uh, frequency can be transformed into depth using the one-third wavelength theory. And this will create the final shear wave velocity model. The third wavelength theory is a numerical and experimental rule that a phase velocity generally represents this, the shear wave velocity at a depth of roughly one half to one third of its wavelength. So to put it simply, depth equals phase velocity divided by frequency divided by three. It's a rough approximation like apparent resistivity. And it's used to create an initial model of inversion, which is then iterated upon. And in my processing, I found that it's actually pretty accurate. Uh, and I usually only will do five iterations to sharpen the model a little bit. I do want to mention 
uh, the impact on environment on passive seismic data. Uh, I've noticed through my, my surveys of the Napa Valley Seismic Project that when I survey in natural environments with very large trees and grass, uh, instead of these kind of busy downtown or uh, urban areas, the data quality comes out much, much better. Even when there is maybe a highway nearby, if there's a buffer line of trees in between, and the, the, the comparative surveys I did will show this, uh, the, the noise from the cars gets absorbed by the roots of the trees, and it really gets filtered out. And the, the trees also, with the deep root systems, also are able to better able bring up these micro tremors to the surface. So if you can, place your passive seismic array near uh, any trees that are nearby. It'll improve the data quality. And it's just across the board, the low frequency response is better near trees. So you might be serving in an urban area like this. It doesn't mean that you have to be completely uh, ignorant of these variables. You can still then, maybe you find some of the trees that are there and you place them nearby. And you find the streets that aren't busy and you place your sensors in those areas. You don't wanna be placing your passive seismic sensors near cars because they will create a lot of active seismic noise which then drowns out your micro tremor signal. Uh, one more thing too is how well it's coupled. How well the geophone is coupled to the ground is incredibly important when getting good data. And it's an it's a underthought about thing. A lot of people just stick it in the ground really quick. They don't think about how it's coupled. So this is really important because that's how the energy from the, that's how the micro tremor or the active energy in the first place is getting to your device and being recorded. So you really want to make sure that geophone is very well coupled, very snug, uh, and there's, it's not loose at all. So uh, lawns, and grassy areas, things that are slightly springy. They will, uh, the geophone can sink into them easily. They're easy to put in, but they'll also form a grip on the geophone. Whereas a hard soil, you might be able to get it in there and twist it in and it feels really snug, but then you give it a slight tap and it'll dislodge from that hard um, cone that it created from the spike. And now you're just getting really loose transfer of seismic waves from the ground to the geophone and then to digital conversion. So you really wanna make sure that you couple your geophone well. And if you're working in an urban environment on asphalt or concrete, you uh, use a base plate. And ideally put a sandbag on top of the geophone to really couple that base plate well. Here are your different survey geometries. Uh, the most common ones for passive seismic. For active seismic would be the the, the line that's like industry standard. But with passive seismic, you can use a line, you can do an L shape, a circle, a triangle. These are kind of the big four that people use. And I wanted to see how these survey geometries compare to each other in terms of data quality. During the Napa Valley Seismic Project, I was using uh, L shape arrays, linear and tri triangular arrays, kind of interchangeably, depending on the site where I was and just what was, best for the site, I would use all three. And I want the data to be comparable between all the sites and equivalent in quality. So about a third of the way through, I decided, okay, I want to find out how these all stack up against each other. I'm gonna include the circle in there. Now, I also I just started experimenting with uh, Fibonacci arrays. So the Fibonacci sequence, which we're gonna talk about extensively after this comparative survey section, I created a Fibonacci spiral geometry based off of that mathematical equation and compared that against the other four. The, the, hypothesis, the hypothesis was that the Fibonacci spiral would have the best data, and we'll go into why, but first let's look at the different data from these five comparative surveys and a bit of background. On June 5th, 2020, my mentor Koichi Hayashi and I as well as Kerry Ruffley from the Napa Valley College, went out and collected data at this, this large field uh, in Napa. And here's Highway 29 right here. So all the cars going up the valley and going down to the Bay Area, they travel up 29. And you can see it's very close by. There's only a couple buildings and a parking lot in between. But there is a very 
a long line of large trees here. And the data that we got that day was absolutely excellent. There was pretty good wind, about 10 to 15 miles per hour consistently throughout the day. So we got really good surface waves from that. So we had a very strong signal in terms of ambient uh, micro tremors. And then these, these trees also blocked a lot of data or a lot of noise from the highway. So it was really a fantastic day. We had perfect conditions to do these five comparative surveys. Each survey was measured for 30 minutes and we did them one after another. Here are the dispersion curves from the five surveys. We have the triangular array, L-shaped, linear, circular, and Fibonacci. And the, the first thing I want to mention is that all the data between these are all remarkably similar. They're all very, very good. So uh, at the end of the day, any of these five survey geometries can be used with pretty good confidence that you're getting good surface wave data and ultimately good shear wave velocity data. But there are some differences. And there are some clear winners uh, between these five. The first thing is we'll see is that the Fibonacci array had the lowest root mean square error. It's the only one that broke 10, and it's at 9.82 after five iterations. Whereas the triangular had the worst at 11.88 meters per second root mean square error uh, after five iterations. You can also see this Fibonacci array collected data beyond 25 hertz, all the way to about 29. And it also got the lowest frequency data, just by a hair, but it beat out the triangular, the circular, and the L shape in terms of low frequency data response. The, the, the L shape array is interesting because at the same frequency as these others, it was able to get a higher phase velocity. And the reason why is it was capturing larger wavelengths. So the L shape array, due to its, it creating really big diagonals, can, create, uh, to, can collect some of this uh, higher phase velocity, lower frequency data, better than some of the others, but it, it does make it a little bit of an outlier. And that data also doesn't exist underneath the direct center of the array. Now, the, the, biggest, the biggest drawback, one, the, probably the weakest array of the bunch would be the linear array. And you can tell because the linear array, these blue dots here, they stop at around four hertz. You can see about four hertz, the, the data for the linear array just tapered off. But for the L shape and others, they go all the way to about two and a half. So you, you still get this really tight fit on the dispersion curve all the way from four to 25 hertz or so. But the low frequency response for these two dimensional arrays is much better than it is for the one dimensional array, which is the line. Before I go any further uh, with these five comparative surveys, I need to explain spacings versus pairs. And it goes back to our, er our earlier discussion with receivers. So remember, we're measuring the wavelengths in between two receivers. So we have receiver one, receiver two. This is a five meter spacing. That's a five meter spacing that we created. If we were to move this receiver out to six meter spacing, now we have a six meter spacing that we've created, two meter, so on and so forth. When you have multiple of the same spacing, that's called a pairing. So spacings are the unique distance between two receivers, and pairs are the same distance, just averaged together. And spacings are important because each unique spacing creates a unique data point that roughly corresponds to depth. The larger the wavelength that you're capturing, 80 meters, for example, <clears throat> will typically give you a depth value at 80 meters. Um, a shear wave velocity value at a depth of 80 meters. And pairings are important because with more pairings uh, for the same spacing, you can become more confident that the data you're getting is good and accurate. You have a lot of pairings for five meters or for 15 meters or uh, 30 meters, then you know it's not a one-off uh, data that might be erroneous. If you have a lot of them, you can average them together and see that they're all the same, then you can be fairly confident that the geologic structure under your array is similar uh, at all these different uh, crosses, you could say. Both spacings and, and pairings are important, and you don't want any to be out of balance with the other. So you want a really uh, a balance between the two. We're gonna explain that. So here's our triangular array. You can see all the different um, 
spacings that there are. You have three 50 meter spacings here on the side. Then you have all these uh, spacings here. And this is a 16 receiver array. So it's a triangle nested within a triangle, nested within a triangle, so on and so forth. And the minimum wavelength that was captured with the triangular array was 1.8 meters, so uh, pretty small. And the maximum wavelength was 50 meters because that's the max distance between the receivers. Uh, the root mean square error value was the highest at 11.88. But I also want to note that uh, uh, an RMSE value of 12 is absolutely fantastic. Like normally you're happy to get below 30. So we were really operating under ideal site conditions uh, during this five comparative survey research project. And that's why the dispersion curves are so uh, similar to each other and overlap so well because we were just uh, we were operating under such great conditions and even then there's still differences that we saw between the surveys and these would only be amplified if the site conditions weren't as good. You can see that the uh, shear wave velocity model to the uh, to the left here and it got data to about 72 meters so the low frequency response was fairly good, even though the max wavelength was only, the max distance was 50 meters. And here's, here's a, one thing to note, and we're gonna be talking about this a lot, is the triangular array had 120 pairs, but only 23 spacings. So with this setup, only 23 unique spacings were created, but you had 120 overlaps overall. So quite a big difference, and you would like to see more spacings because that fills in your data better. Let's see that right here. Here we have our phase velocity um, diagram. This is kind of like the raw data. And it's very clear. Here's your, the blue is your uh, highest um, amplitude. And the, the purple pink is your lowest, your lowest strength. And you have phase velocity here on the left which again is uh, meters per second, and if your frequency on the right. So we can see that our, our most confident data, right, our most confident data follows this blue. Not that much noise, pretty good, but it does taper off around 20. Maybe you extend it right to there and go to 25. But beyond, beyond anywhere here, you're, you're just making the data up. Now with the spacings, uh, this is important. This is your coherency graph showing for frequency and then also for distance. This is spacing distance between receivers. And you'll see that there's a, um, there's a pairing here. There's no one here, but we have this huge gap and a huge gap there, some early on, where we just don't collect any data. We don't get any spacings uh, anywhere from 33 to 43, right? And these other areas, this white area. So, it's you, you, when that happens, you have to interp, uh, interpret between these different spacings. And this might be the reason why we get a little higher noise, a higher mode offshoot there. You get a little bit of kind of like tornado action where it just kind of whips around. It doesn't stay nice and linear. Um, it's hard to say exactly what some of those features are. It gets, it gets really weak right there. You can see that it gets weak right there compared to the strength of the coherency here. Uh, so you really want to have good spacings throughout uh, your array and really even distribution of spacings throughout your array so you don't run into, into these problems. And the triangular array suffers from those problems. Here's an L-shape array. And uh, there was also an offshoot that we added, so a 45-degree diagonal offshoot. And the minimum wavelength that we captured here was three meters because we had a three meter spacing right there. And the max wavelength was 70.7, which is this far, this very long distance diagonal wavelength. Here's the S-wave velocity model. And you can see that we got data nearly to 80 meters. So very good uh, depth for a single array. Remember active methods, you, you're getting data right up to about 30 meters and you might be getting edge effects at 30 meters that can affect the quality of your data. In 30 minutes of data collection with a 50 meter L-shape array, 50 meters here, 50 meters there, we got data to 80 meters. So nearly triple 
And you can, you can really hear, if we look just at 30 meters, there's your 30 meters of data. You get a lot of geologic information below that 30 meters, which is relevant and useful, whether you're writing a geologic report or you're, you're trying to understand, understand the structure better. So these passive methods are really powerful in being able to get data beyond 30 meters very easily and, for, and faster and easier than active seismic methods. So uh, our, MS, our RMSE value is really good for the L-shape, 10.77. And we can see our pairs to spacings ratio improve. <clears throat> we have 120 pairs, 75 spacings. So that's a pretty good ratio. And we'll see that in the raw data. And the pros of the L-shape are that it's easy set up. You just put out two lines and lay out your geophones and that's it. And mo these wavelengths really cover this 2D area well. How well you cover a 2D area is important. Are there big gaps where you just don't get any uh, wavelengths through? And there are some here on the edges, but overall, I mean, it's packed with wavelengths down here. So that's good. And this is your center of the array. The, the, the cons are that the, the wavelengths kind of vary. You're getting your near surface wavelengths near the center, but your longest wavelengths are off to the side. So it, they, ideally, all the wavelengths will pass as close to the center as possible to give you that perfect point value going down, right? This is a single point going down uh, into the earth. And, and in reality, with an L shape, you have a point, you have your points here for the near surface, and then instead of going straight down, they actually kind of go off at an angle. So there's a little bit of um, L shapes can create that problem, that's their biggest con. Here's the raw data, really tight um, phase velocity diagram here. And this was some noise from a receiver that was placed on a electrical line. We just, it was buried, we didn't know it was there. So we'll see that in the linear line uh, array as well, but that's what stopped it. I'm not sure if that would have gone, gone data beyond that, but um, as of right now, I got data straight up to 25 meters, some strong noise here, softer noise there, but still easy to pick that, really good coherency, and you don't really get any of these soft sections of coherency like you did with the triangular array. Goes up, good data. If we go down here, we'll see that we have really good spacing distribution all the way up to 50. And then we only get a few beyond 50, but those are honestly kind of like bonuses because those, those are those very long diagonals be, between the L shape. So it's hard to create a lot of spacings at greater uh, distances like that with an L shape. You would have to kind of get creative with uh, offshoots and things of that nature. But this is overall really nice, good coherencies, the black there is are your coherencies. So when, when these lines are black, then that means they're closer to one. We can see coherencies here. That's actually that, that bar of noise, right? That's that noise right there. But we also see some coherency waves going like this at different hertz, different frequencies. So that's, that's kind of unknown as of right now, why that happens. I'm, I'm guessing it does something with the, the resonance of the earth, the resonance of a site, and also maybe the, the geofoam frequency used, but really good data. Here's a linear array, and this was a geometry, simply a line, and one of the geofoams that we used actually buggered out, it ran out of battery, so we only did this one with 15 receivers instead of 16, so that's the one difference between this uh, array and all the others. And this is the one that had trouble getting data beyond four hertz. And as a result, it only got data to 44 meters. So the L shape, shear wave velocity profile, goes from zero to 80. And the linear array goes from zero to 44 or so. So huge difference. They were out for the same amount of time and used nearly the same amount of receivers, only one off in the linear. And that extra receiver would have been placed here. It would not have made a difference. So you can see why uh, learning these different survey geometries that you can use, becoming proficient with them, and using them instead of the kind of industry standard linear array, which is originally based off of using a spread cable where the geophones are connected because they have a wire connecting them, uh, is beneficial. You can only create some of these arrays if you have a nodal seismic system. 
a seismograph that has your geophone, your receiver, and an independent battery, GPS, Wi-Fi, what have you. Now, the big benefit to linear array is that it's the simplest of setup. It's, it's really just a line that you put out on the ground. Very, very simple. You can do it with the spread cable. You can also do uh, L-shaped arrays with the spread cable, though it's slightly more difficult. But that's the big benefit to them. Minimum wavelength we captured was 3 meters. Max was 50. Had a pretty bad RS RMSE value error. And it has the same fate as the triangle in terms of pairs of spacings, 105 pairs. 28 spacings. So you get a lot of overlap though. So these guys overlap a lot, but you don't, you, there's, no, there's zero dimensionality. You remember with passive seismic methods, we want dimensionality. Any waves are traveling now that aren't going exactly this direction are going to do poorly. And the linear array that we set up was actually really well suited for our site geometry. We had that highway producing noise filtered through the trees, the highway was over here, the trees were there, and then we had our linear array like this. So we set it up in a way that was ideal, and the data still did not come out as well as the L-shape or other arrays. Here is the raw data. You can see it's a little crisper. Anytime you do a linear array, it comes out kind of more crisp and jagged, and we left one of the G phones in place. Uh, for the linear array and from the L-shape. So that's why we still have that band at 25 hertz. Uh, but you can see, probably wouldn't have gone data beyond that because the noise started increasing, soft noise up here. Uh, but overall, you have a good fit, but you just lose out on your low frequency. You only get data at about four hertz or so. Beyond that, you, you lose it. Here's your coherencies. You can see all the regular spacing gaps. Uh, with the linear array. So it's, it's well distributed, but there's big gaps in between each of the spacings, which is something you want to avoid. And we'll really see the difference between this uh, with the Fibonacci spiral. It's pretty amazing. So here's the circular array that we set up. We did a double circle, and there was only one receiver missing because we wanted to keep it at 16 receivers, and really forms a beautiful pattern. Uh, all these wavelengths cross over really nicely throughout this full 2D area, dated about 73 meters or so. So really good uh, data and data from about one, two meters down. But the minimum wavelength capture with the circular array was 9.6 meters. And that is the minimum spacing. That's this spacing right here, 9.6 meters. And the max wavelength was 50, which is all the way from here to there, or there to there, any of these diagonals. And the RMSE value was pretty low, so 10.93, so good error after five iterations. But the, the circle is actually the worst when it comes to pairs and spacings, because there's really not that much, uh, that, that many different pairs. You have this pair right there that's repeated like eight times, and then you have that pair that's re repeated a bunch. And this is a 12.5 meter spacing right there. Well, you have the same spacing there too. So there's just a ton of overlap with these circular arrays. And you can set them up differently so you can solve some of those problems. Maybe you make this circle closer so you get a, a lower minimum wavelength. But now you have a really big spacing there. You don't have any data in between, kind of. And uh, overall, the circular array, array suffers from some of these problems with spacings that uh, I, I, I find is less than ideal. And it's really, it takes a long time to set up. So a circular array takes a long time to set up and requires a lot of channels for the same amount of spacings or for pairings. And you, you have to have a very large channel system to, to do a circular array and get fantastic data. And for someone that might be limited in terms of their, uh, their budget and not being able to buy a bunch of receivers, your circular array is probably not your best bet. But it does give you really good data across that full 2D area. Here's the raw data for the circular array, your phase velocity diagram. And we can see a lot of noise here, very strong noise below, some fairly strong soft noise up top. So you can still kind of select this data out to 25 or so. Beyond 25 meters, at this point, you're just guessing, though it looks like it continues. It's hard to say. Uh, I wouldn't make that judgment. I would be conservative and stop at 25. But good, really good uh, banding here. 
in the five to 10 Hertz range. I mean, that's fantastic. And then a uh, good low frequency response too. But here's your problem. Look at these big gaps for the spacings. I mean, this is a huge, probably uh, eight meter gap there. And then we have another like six meter gap. So that, that's, that's less than ideal. And you know, the, the fact that you, you really start to encounter a lot of noise beyond 15 Hertz with this geometry setup because your minimum spacing was 9.6 is also less than ideal. So the circle has some good aspects to it and we can repurpose that and we'll, uh, for other survey geometries. And we'll see how we can use these different survey geometries later, how you can use them together to really get excellent data. So that, that was one of the whole points of the comparative surveys was to learn what are the strengths, what are the weaknesses, and how we can combine them in order to get the absolute best data for a site. Now here's the Fibonacci spiral. And this is a really cool survey geometry. It follows the Fibonacci ratio and you just spirals in like this, just like a Nautilus shell. So very, very cool data to about 76 meters. So almost tied the L shape, but you have this really good distribution of spacings across a full 2D area. And these spacings travel through the center most of the time, or at least they connect to the center. Minimum wavelength was 0.8 meters. Max wavelength was 56.5 meters. So it, it got data to like 76 meters with a max wavelength of 56.5, whereas the L shape got data to 80 meters with a max wavelength of 70.7. So the Fibonacci ray also has a better low frequency response. And we saw that when we compared all five dispersion curves. Now here's where it's really special though. 120 SPAC pairs, 87 spacings. It beats the L shape, blows the triangle, the, uh, the linear, and the circle out of the water in terms of spacings. You'll see the coherency data soon. And the pros of the Fibonacci ray is that it has a very large number and a very even distribution of spacings due to the way it's constructed. All these diagonals end up creating every single increment that you would want. Uh, most wavelengths have their, um, are, are situated near or through the center. It scales really easily. All you have to do is add the next point out and measure it out and has a great low frequency response. But it takes a while to set up. It's, it's honestly, it's easier to set up than the circle, but it takes about a similar amount of time as the triangle. Here's your, your raw data, your coherency data. Look at that, almost no noise. If the, data, the noise that is there is very soft. It's very clear that you're getting great data all the way 30 meters. That's because you have this really close space in here, right? These receivers are very close together. So they're able to get really good coherency all the way up to 30 meters. And then you also have these really spread out receivers. So you get good coherency throughout. And there's no upward drafts or you know, uh, jumps to higher modes. It's just a nice, very clean band of data all the way from uh, about three, uh, maybe two and a half to 30 hertz. Fantastic. Really good coherencies here. We can see the black bars. Again, we have this uh, kind of striping pattern there, but great data all the way through and only a couple of gaps beyond. We, and that's just the nature of uh, how you set it up. You could always strategically put a GFO down, uh, GFO down to get some of these, these spacings, but even just following basic Fibonacci spiral geometry, unbelievable um, uh, spacings are generated uh, I mean, look at this, you can't even see the lines, they're all just blending together. So really, really fantastic data from the Fibonacci array, had the lowest RMSE value error, had the nicest looking data, and the best dispersion curve. So the takeaways from the comparative surveys would be that the Fibonacci spiral, which was the best, was about 20% better than the triangle, which was the worst in terms of the root mean square error. But in reality, all the surveys collected excellent data that's because we chose a really good field site. There were some trees nearby that filtered out the highway noise. It was very, very windy. It was 10 to 15 miles per hour nonstop. So excellent surface waves were created from the wind. And as a result, the, the traffic noise was very low uh, in amplitude in response to the ambient micro tremors that we were collecting. 
The linear and L-shaped arrays are the easiest to set up and circles are the hardest because you have to draw a whole bunch of different angles and midpoints for the circles. And the triangle and Fibonacci arrays are about similar in setup time and difficulty, which is good because the, the Fibonacci array is better. So if you have the site and you have the time and you understand the mathematics, which we're about to get to, then opt for the Fibonacci array. But overall, passive seismic methods are very well studied and they're a very low air method for determining shear wave characteristics of the subsurface. There's a, there's a lot of belief out there that you need to do cross hole or down hole or comb petrometer testing or any of these other very uh, non, they're, they're destructive methods uh, that cost a lot of money and require a large crew to get good shear wave velocity information. And it's simply not true. You can use passive seismic methods and it's been very well researched and you can do it with a single person in about an hour and get fantastic shear wave velocity information that matches up right there with the cross hole data, with the drilling data, et cetera. And, and honestly, it can let you have, uh, it can let you collect shear wave velocity information in areas which you might not otherwise be able to get. Uh, because these are nodal systems, you can put them anywhere you can ideally survey at night to get the best data, and you can operate, operate around, maybe uh, construction crews are there. It's, it's really a very powerful method and will eventually become the industry standard when it comes to um, generating shear wave velocity profiles, for sure. So the geometry considerations and kind of a loose order of importance is you really want something that's easy to set up. That, that's key. And that's why the linear array for MASW is so common because you roll out a spread cable and you're set up. So ease of setup, but the quality of data matters a lot. Uh, that's right up there with the how easy it is to set up. Um, so yeah, you can roll out a spread cable and get some data, but if your data is not gonna be good, it has no dimensionality, then you might want to rethink your array that you're doing. And an L-shape array provides a really good um, alternative because the L-shape combines some of the best aspects of uh, ease of setup and simple to use, things of that nature, but it also has, again, a lot of spacings and a really good low frequency response. So we'll talk about that more in a little bit. You want an even distribution of spacings and a high number of spacings. Those are right up there. And you also want most of your data to pass through kind of your array midpoint. Uh, that way you get an accurate 1D point value uh, for the shear wave velocity with depth. You don't want those shear wave velocity values to actually be pulled off from 30 meters to the side. You want them relatively close to that midpoint. You want a good number of pairs so everything stacks well. You don't want um, everything to just be a single measurement. Ideally, you have some overlap and some averaging done. And you want something that scales easily. You want to be able to ideally use a method that can just keep scaling so there's very little thought for the operator. Uh, if they go to a new site, they have an established method that they can do to scale it out, whether they need to get data at a lower um, depth, really high resolution data at lower depth, or if they need to get data all the way to 300 meters, 400 meters, something that scales well is important. And because you have a limited number of receivers, so if you only have uh, 20 receivers and you want to get data all the way from zero to 200, you need something that can scale and still get the spacings and the pairings needed for the good data. So that's important. Your ratio of channels to your spacings and your ratio of channels to your wavelength range is really important. And the triangle, for example, does really poorly with this because you keep nesting the triangles within each other. So you need a lot of channels in order to expand your wavelength range and, and scale it. Same with the circle. But uh, the Fibonacci method can be used to scale easily. So now we're gonna talk about the Fibonacci method and Fibonacci for geophysics. During the data collection for the Napa Valley Seismic Project, I began experimenting with Fibonacci spiral geometries and uh, I had a hypothesis that Fibonacci numbers used in survey geometry, used in array geometry, would result in better quality data. And that's because of the golden ratio, which we'll talk about in just a moment. And I originally, when I first started doing these, I didn't have the equipment needed to make those precise angles, but I just kind of laid them out by hand. 
and I still got better data than I did with my triangular rays, my L shape, and my linear rays, which I uh, was able to get those precise angles. So I knew I was onto something when I first started experimenting with these Fibonacci spiral geometries with the passive seismic methods compared to the other array geometries. And that's why we did the five comparative surveys was to see how, the, see how they all compared to each other and which ones came out on top. So here's the Fibonacci sequence. It's a mathematical sequence that was famously developed by Leonardo of Pisa in 1202, but in reality, it was described in Indian mathematics as early as 200 BC. So it's been around for a long, long time, and it's a very simple mathematical proof. Basically, you have two, you have two starting numbers, f of zero and f of one. f of zero is zero, and f of one is one. And this equation, you use this equation for all numbers greater than one. So f of two would equal f of two minus one plus f of two minus two. So f of two would equal f of one plus f of zero. So f of two would equal one. Now at this point, you just basically start to add them together. Uh, that's how the equation works. So you have f of zero plus f of one added together equal one. Then one plus one equals two, two plus one equals three, three plus two equals five, five plus eight is 13, 21, 34, you get the point. But you can see how it doesn't scale linearly. It, it scales at this ratio and it starts to grow pretty quickly. And there's a lot more to the mathematics than that as we'll dig into. Here's the golden ratio. And as the Fibonacci numbers start to scale up, they start to approach what's known as the golden ratio. And the golden ratio is basically this size here, A to B, is the same um, in ratio as A is to B. So this full length, A could be considered the equivalent of B for this full length, and then there's B plus A. It's it's really a beautiful ratio, and it's it's seen in uh, aesthetics and beauty, and like the face of a model will often follow the golden ratio in terms of like where the nose is and the eyes and a lot of artwork. You'll have the uh, golden ratio is very evident in like the best artwork. And you see the nature too. Um, so the, the, the golden ratio is uh, basically will, will usually, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a way to kind of move towards perfection. And my thought was that the Fibonacci ratio, since it approaches the golden ratio, would provide the best data. So we're gonna explain, I'm gonna show you why the Fibonacci ratio is so great for passive seismic and array geometries because of the spacings and the pairings and how it can create these, it has these fantastic dynamics for creating a lot of spacings and pairings. We're gonna use a 21 meter array to illustrate this. So we have receivers at 0, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and 21, which uh, we're, we're skipping that extra one, right? So 0 to 21 with those. And, um, and then we're also going to kind of subtract off these uh, other receivers here. So from 0 to 21, we have a 21-meter spacing that we create. From 21 to 1, we have a 20 meter spacing that we create. From the 21 to two receivers, we have a 19, and so on and so forth, all the way down to 13, which is eight. Now 13 to five creates an eight right here, right? And uh, eight to zero creates an eight. So we already here with this line have three uh, pairings uh, of the eight meter spacing. And in fact, the only spacings that aren't created for a Linear 21 meter Fibonacci array are 9, 14, 15, and 17. They're the only ones are missing. Now, if you had a 5 meter spacing for a 20 meter line, you would only have four receivers. This one has eight receivers, but you would only have spacings at 5, 10, 15, and 20 meters. So, in that case, you have 14 spacings versus 17 spacings. The, the linear line would have uh, maybe greater overlap, more pairs, but the Fibonacci sequence actually pairs, creates pairs really well too. So here, here we can explain that. So here's the same 21 meter line, 
And we have spacings that are measured three times, spacings that are measured twice, and spacings that are measured once, and spacings that are never measured. And uh, basically, your largest Fibonacci number that you'll use will be measured once. Your second largest Fibonacci number will be measured twice. All your other Fibonacci numbers will be measured three times with a linear array because of the way it doubles back on itself. Because you add the numbers together, 5 plus 8 to go to 13, right? You create this dynamic where you can measure them multiple times even though you're not laying out a 5 meter spacing uh, one after another. So that's really, really brilliant. And you don't get too many pairs on the same spacing. You don't need 20 pairs on your five meter, but three is nice, right? Third time's the charm. Now, there are a few spacings that you don't measure, and you could fix that by putting a node maybe at that spacing. There's a lot of different options there. Maybe put in an offshoot and get a whole bunch of diagonals, which run through those numbers. But overall, the Fibonacci array is really, really good at generating a bunch of spacings that are also measured a lot. Now, with an L-shape array, this stacks up even more. So this is a this is a 150 meter line, and this is a 24 channel MASW survey, five meter spacing. This is kind of industry standard with, with basically what people lay out and use all the time. Now you could do a 19 AU, a 19 receiver, 55 meter L-shaped Fibonacci array. And in regards to creating a IBC site classification number, you'll get much better data from this less channel, less receiver array, this L-shaped array. Because you'll get data, you have a one meter spacing, a two meter, three, five, but you go all the way up to 55 meters here and you double it by using an L-shape. And we can see here, there's 60 spacings created with this lower channel receiver uh, array, and there's only 23 spacings created with this 24 channel. And your greatest length here is at 150 meters, which you collect once. Then you collect this 110 meter one twice, though they're almost identical because they're not over different sections of the ground. So basically, the coherences, coherences are going to be nearly the same. And remember, the uh, the low frequency response for a linear array is terrible. It's compared to the other receivers, it's terrible. Four hertz versus two and a half, uh, as we saw in the five comparative, though that's site dependent. So you can lop off already. You're not, you're not going to get 115 meters in depth, a good data point there with the linear array. You won't. Maybe you'll get to 90, which is good. But we have 55 meters here, we have 55 meters there. Now we've created like an 80 plus meter spacing there. And we know that uh, there's a really good low frequency response with L shapes. So in reality, these are very comparable, though this uses less channels, has greater spacings. And because it uses um, mathematics, which are good for passive seismic, uh, it's overall a much better method to use. It's also easier to fit into an area. A 115 meter line can be difficult, especially in urban areas. You have to stop tra uh, traffic and cars. Here, you can fit this into uh, a small lot pretty easily. So here's what the spacings would look like for a 55 meter Fibonacci array. You have a ton of spacings created at these close ones, but you also get these really nice diagonals going across. And it's really, really, really beautiful. And the the, the benefit of the Fibonacci array, the L-shaped Fibonacci array, is that you get six spacings. You get six pairs for all your Fibonacci numbers that are back from the main number by two. You get two pairs for your greatest number because it's repeated twice, and you get four pairs for your second largest Fibonacci number, and you get six for all the others. In addition, all those one-off spacings that you collected in this line are now uh, doubled because you have two lines. So the L shape has really good spacings. Uh, it also creates all these unique diagonals which fill in the gaps, but then you also create a lot of pairings. And after I did this five comparative surveys, what I ended up doing is I, I figured out this Fibonacci L shape array 
And I began doing a lot of the Fibonacci L shapes as my standard uh, survey geometry for the Napa Valley Seismic Project. And what I found was that my RMSE value was typically less than 15 meters per second. It was very good, uh, especially if the environment was quiet and there wasn't that much noise. And oftentimes the RMSE value was getting pretty close to 10. Uh, and this is just random surveys in the middle of the day, not under ideal conditions where no one's around. This data, I, I forgot to mention, all this data was collected during uh, severe lockdowns in California. Remember June 2020? So car noise and overall just people traveling was very much reduced compared to pre-March 2020. Um, overall, the, the, the human activity reduce the, the noise, and overall, the data quality went up dramatically. That's actually one of the reasons I started the Napa Seismic Project, is because at that time, it was a fantastic opportunity to collect really high quality data without much uh, human noise in it. So that's, that, that started to increase as the time went on and people started to become more active. But this Fibonacci L-shaped array was able to still get me really, really good data, even as human activity increased. So we're going to go over just a couple other notable survey geometries and uh, that I did in the Napa Valley Seismic Project. And this is where we talked about how you can combine different survey geometries. Here, I was at a park that had a half circle lawn. And I was wondering, OK, how do I get good data here? So I created a half circle with the receivers and I added a Fibonacci line on top. I wanted to get all those close spacings to get that good uh, high frequency data with very little noise. But then the, the circle also gives you really good data in this band. So by combining a 55 meter Fibonacci line with a 25 meter radius half circle, which has these 22.5 degree arcs, I was able to get excellent data at a site class B. You can see here the phase velocity is hovering right around 800, 700. And typically, passive seismic methods uh, don't work as well when the phase velocity of a site is higher. Um, it's just harder to capture uh, uh, faster wavelengths. So uh, the fact that I got this excellent data at site class B by combining two novel survey geometries is really exciting because it shows that you can be flexible with your survey geometry in your arrays and get excellent, excellent data. Another notable one was uh, when I had a very small half acre lot that I was surveying in and it was pretty narrow, wasn't able to do an L shape. So I did a Fibonacci line here. And then I had a little bit extra room. So I added some spacings to go back in order to effectively create kind of like one and a half Fibonacci lines. Then I put a corner point on each to create some diagonals. And uh, while there is noise in this data, you can still see that clearly the coherency is run through here. And when I picked those and I collected those picks, I was able to get my lowest RMSE value error of the whole project. So after five iterations, the RMSE error for N81 was 8.88 meters per second. So the neighborhood I was in was very, very quiet. And even when your site is limited in many ways, this is again a small half acre site, by, you, by utilizing uh, Fibonacci mathematics and some clever geometry considerations, you can get really, really excellent data um, using these techniques. So I wanna finish by saying that the Napa Valley Seismic Project is open to all contributors and volunteers. This is an active project and we're still working on crunching all the data that was collected in the summer of 2020. And uh, the final goal is to create a really cool 3D model of the, the, the geologic structure of the Napa Valley and to pair that with some deeper geologic models that the USGS has created. So this is still being worked on. Our website is napaseismic.org. And on that website, you can see a lot of the data that we've posted. Uh, there's some educational resources to understand this more. And eventually all the surveys that were done are gonna be, um, a report will be created on them and posted to Napa Seismic under end surveys. So if you would like to contribute to the Napa Valley Seismic Project, which is an open source geophysics project for the benefit of the community, 
and for scientists around the world, you can uh, contact me through napaseismic.org. And this is an ongoing project, so any contributors and volunteers are much appreciated. My name is Stefan Burns with Geometrics. I'm a senior geophysicist there. Uh, the equipment that I used was the Atom Seismograph, our one channel and our three channel systems. This is a small uh, nodal seismograph that does not have to be connected to the others via cable. They operate wirelessly and completely independently of each other. And really, this project would not have been possible without using the Atom Seismograph. And the Atom Seismograph collects excellent data. Uh, I, use two ju I use two hertz phones for all this data collection, and I also collected HVSR uh, data for every single site using the Atom 3 component. So if you're interested in learning more about the Atom seismograph, you can go to geometrics.com, that's G-E-O-M-E-T-R-I-C-S.com, go to products, find the Atom. There also will be a link in the video description. And with that, Thank you for joining us. Uh, today we talked about passive seismic, shear wave velocities, uh, surface waves, survey geometries, and then also the Fibonacci method and how the Fibonacci numbers can be applied to passive seismic and how it can improve data quality. I hope if you're a uh, seismologist that uses active seismic that you consider uh, incorporating passive seismic into your repertoire. And if you're a passive seismologist, I'd like to hear from you in the comments below and experiment with the Fibonacci method and let us know how it goes. Again, thank you so much for joining and have a great day. Ciao.